All right, good afternoon and welcome to this latest in a series of conversations sponsored by the College of Communication and designed to bring distinguished leaders and experts in several fields, chiefly some of the most accomplished pe people in the communications industries, to our college and the university. These events serve three purposes. First, they better acquaint our freshmen and sophomores with the various career paths they might more wisely choose as they decide in spring term which of the departments they will choose to join. Second, the presence of these outstanding individuals enriches the intellectual life of the college. And finally, such events also enrich the cultural and intellectual life of Boston University and the greater Boston community. Before going on to introduce my guests, allow me two or three quick other remarks. The first is to specially welcome and recognize as well two other Pulitzer Prize winners who are in our audience today. Mark Thompson of Time Magazine, please stand. Mark, thank you. And, and, and Don Goodrich, a photographer at Newsday, again a Pulitzer Prize winner. If I were to say to any of you, run me a list of the problems, the ills, uh, the trends, the sins of journalism. You'd all have a list, a laundry list that quickly came to mind. Were I to then say to you, but also please recognize that journalism is the, the only profit-making private group of corporations in America that not only run publicly confessions of their own sins, but in fact are the source for what you know about what's wrong with journalism. And there are no other private profit-making industries in America that do that, yet it's done every day and without prompting. Journalism, as I said this morning, is indeed a critical profession. As Thomas Jefferson once said, there never was and never will be a people who are both ignorant and free. And the sad news is that as we increase in seeing signs of ignorance and of apathy, we are in grave danger in our society of being increasingly ignorant and therefore not free and therefore not truly a vibrant democracy. And I will tell you further about the definition of democracy that every democracy first must meet two criteria. Criterion, us. One, criteria, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> we'll get it right and my Latin teacher now shudders, spins in his grave. The first is, that it's open, free, and fair elections. But the second is a free press, without which you don't have a democracy. So we're honored here today to present to you two gentlemen, and I might add that any number of ladies and gentlemen, also Pulitzer Prize winners, will be here tomorrow in panel discussions at 9.30 and again at 11. And please check at the Com College as to exactly where and how to be at the place where you will have panels of these prize winners talking about various aspects of journalism and about job opportunities. So we welcome you and please attend. Today, we are privileged to have as our guests two highly distinguished and award-winning journalists both recipients of the distinguished of the Pulitzer Prize, the most prestigious award in print journalism. Don Van Natta, Jr. is a graduate of Com class of 86. He's now an investigative correspondent for the New York Times. Before that, while with the Miami Herald in 1993, he shared the Pulitzer for public service for the newspaper's coverage of Hurricane Andrew. After joining the New York Times in 1995, he was a member of two reporting teams that received Pulitzer Prizes. You know, two for explanatory reporting uh, for coverage of the worldwide terror threat posed by Al Qaeda, and in 1999 for national reporting on the corporate sale of U.S. technology to China. At the Times, Mr. Van Natta has also covered terrorism, the crash of TWA Flight 800, the impeachment of former President Bill Clinton, and the deadlocked 2000 presidential election. He is the author of First Off the Tee, Presidential Hackers, Duffers, and Cheaters from Taft to Bush, written in 2003. And we might add that the College of Communication presented Mr. Van Natta with a Distinguished Alumni Award in 2000. Our other speaker today is Tom Fiedler, 
who received his MS degree in journalism at BU in 1971. He is the executive editor of the Miami Herald, where he oversees a staff of nearly 400 news professionals. In 1991, while writing for the Herald, he shared a Pulitzer for spot news reporting for a team report on the Yahweh cult's political influence and their links to several murders. During his career, spanning more than three decades at the Herald, he has held positions including editor of the editorial pages, political editor and columnist, White House correspondent, and war correspondent during the Persian Gulf War. Most notably, he reported on every presidential contest between 1972 and 1996, and he wrote the Florida Institute of Government's Almanac, uh, Almanac of Florida Politics, year 2000. That must have been a juicy read, given what happened in 2000 in Florida. In 2003, Calm presented Tom Fiedler with a Distinguished Alumni Award to mark his important contributions and many achievements. I will now ask our moderator for today, Chairman of the Journalism Department, Bob Zelnick, a very distinguished journalist and correspondent in his own right, to come forward and take over as moderator so that as he sits here and after the questions come, he will repeat them in the microphone and for the telecast so that everyone can hear. Bob, please step forward and now please join me in welcoming first Don Van Matta. Thank you, Dean, for that wonderful introduction. And uh, hi, everybody. It's great to be back at Boston University. I'm thrilled to uh, share the stage with two journalism heroes of mine, Bob Zelnick and Tom Fiedler. The college is so fortunate to have as its journalism chairman someone as smart, talented, and energetic as Bob. And I wanted to thank you for putting together this terrific program. When Tom Fiedler broke his famous story about Gary Hart and his weekend trips to Bimini on a boat named Monkey Business, I remember reading every word of his article in the Calm Lounge. Not long after that, I was lucky enough to land a job at the Miami Herald, where I was a colleague of Tom's for eight years in the greatest news town in America. And Tom, I learned a lot just by watching you work the political beat. And thank you for that. And I got to tell you guys, there's not many people in this business as nice and as tough as Tom is. And I feel privileged to be part of the conversation with him here today. 24 years ago this fall, I arrived here as a freshman and probably like a lot of you guys when you were freshmen, I wondered and worried about whether I had any hope at all of becoming a journalist. Back then, everyone was saying that the newspaper business's days were numbered. At the time, people were worried about cable television. They were siphoning off readers and advertisers, and I wondered what every college kid worries about. Will someone be crazy enough to hire me? And I also thought, does the career I have chosen even have a future? And now this afternoon, I'm back here 24 years later, and even though I got a pretty good job at a newspaper that's pretty good, despite some things you've probably been reading in the press lately about it, I can't help wondering again, does the career I have chosen even have a future? Because as we all know, the news is bleak. Get on the web and a few thousand bloggers will gleefully tell you print is dead. Well, they don't quite say it that way. They say the MSM is dead, or they say it's dying a slow, agonizing death mostly from self-inflicted wounds. Unfortunately, there's some truth to that. The statistics are depressing. Circulation numbers are tumbling. Ad pages are down. Newspaper company stock prices, as Tom and I can tell you, are plummeting. Talented reporters and editors are being bought out or laid off. And most of all, credibility, our credibility, is at an all-time low. Dan Rather resigned, but didn't apologize, as one blogger noted. My former colleague, Judith Miller, retired, <laughs> CNN chief news executive Easton Jordan resigned, and even Bob Woodward had to apologize to his editor yesterday for failing to be entirely upfront with him. Now, when even the great Bob Woodward gets tarnished by a now infamous leak case, you have to wonder, will there be any journalism heroes left standing? Our industry is struggling to redefine itself at a time when it is under attack from many fronts. The business is struggling to compete with the 24-hour news cycle the internet, and most recently, the power of the bloggers. More and more people, especially young people, 
see little difference between filtered and unfiltered news. The Daily Show with Jon Stewart has as much and maybe even more influence with how young people view the world than the NBC Nightly News with Brian Williams. We are living in an incredibly chaotic and even confusing time. Our country is at war. We are constantly being reminded of terror alerts and threats. Millions of people believe the government constantly dissembles or lies to them, and often with few or no consequences. And so the public is even more in need of a vibrant free press to seek out the truth. And if the press is going to survive and perhaps even flourish again, we must continue to invest in the one thing we do better than anyone else, and that is investigate and report the truth. That's why investigative reporting is more important today than ever before. The future of the newspaper industry depends on newspapers continuing to invest in investigative reporting. This kind of work is incredibly expensive. It often takes months to do a single story, and such indulgences are harder for executives to justify during tough economic times. But without investigative and enterprise reporting, newspapers will become irrelevant. It's absolutely necessary for reporters to get the time, resources, and most of all, the support from their editors to do the big, important stories that readers won't find anywhere else. But it's not easy. I mean, it's never been easy, but it's harder now than ever before. The Bush administration, in my opinion, is the most secretive administration in our history. September 11th made probing questions seem unpatriotic. In the weeks after the attacks on the Twin Towers and the Pentagon, conservative groups criticized the press for finding fault with the White House. There were repercussions for asking the wrong questions or being on the wrong side. Each year, more and more journalists are subpoenaed and forced to testify about their sources, both in criminal cases and civil cases. Last year, the Bush administration classified 81% more documents than the government had classified in 2000. A part of that is because of the war on terror, and, and, and part of that was justified. There are some in the administration who view a government employee who talks to a reporter as disloyal and, in some cases, even a traitor. The result of all of this is the American press, in my view, has become even more deferential in, over the past few months and even years to a wartime president. I was posted in London from early 2003 until just this past August. The British press has many problems. There are comic book tabloids peddling gossip and opinion opposing as the facts. But I was struck by the aggressive way the British press corps questions Tony Blair. It's very different from the way President Bush is asked questions at a news conference here. The Brits not only asked the right questions, they, but they were not satisfied if they were not answered in a forthright, for, forthright way by Mr. Blair. Let's face it, these times demand a little muckraking. Americans want it. They yearn for it. It's why a polemicist like Michael Moore is seen by some as a savior of American journalism, and he's not a journalist. I think a lot of people are turning to the bloggers for news and commentary because they're convinced they're not getting the straight story from the mainstream media. Some people believe bloggers are doing more meaningful investigative journalism than some major newspapers. A few bloggers have broken important stories, and I think that's a good thing, because competition's always a good thing. But newspapers cannot cede investigative reporting to bloggers, or newspapers will die. And the sad truth is, some papers are heading that way. The Orlando Sentinel, I just learned from Tom, shut down their investigative reporting unit of three people. Many American newspapers no longer give reporters the time or the money to focus on long-term, in-depth stories, or they have too many inexperienced reporters who are not yet ready to take on this difficult job. And as I said earlier, investigative reporting is hard. It's hard because the stories are nuanced. They're never black and white. Sources have conflicts of interest that you have to root out. People often don't tell you the truth. Corporate interests are powerful and sometimes intimidating. Prosecutors and civil litigants are routinely demanding that reporters reveal their sources. And the government demands that reporters refrain from writing about a secret prison or a torture memo because they say publishing it will harm or compromise national security. Well, sometimes these are legitimate concerns by the government, but sometimes they're not. This administration, by the way, does this constantly because they've discovered playing the national security card with newspapers works. Let me give you a couple examples. Dana Priest of the Washington Post wrote a terrific piece recently, some of you probably saw it, about black sites, these CIA secret prisons, that she said were located in Eastern Europe where the CIA is believed to torture terror suspects. She knew the countries, but she didn't publish them. The administration persuaded her not to publish them, a matter of national security, they said. 
A day later, Human Rights Watch identified the countries as Poland and Romania, and not surprisingly, Congress, not long after that, announced another leak investigation. I'll give an example of something I had to deal with uh, when I was in London for the Times. In March 2004, I wrote a front page story about a Swiss phone card in a mobile phone that was used to pinpoint the precise whereabouts of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. <coughs> Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was the operational commander of Al Qaeda and the mastermind of 9 11. The terrorists preferred these, these Swiss kind of cards because they felt it enhanced their security when they talked on the phone, though there was a flaw in them that made it even easier for the government to track someone's whereabouts. It's a flaw that they discovered when KSM got arrested and they stopped using them. Now, he had been using this cell phone with this kind of card, and the authorities found him in Pakistan, and I found out about this a year later after they nabbed him. The CIA chief at the time, George Tenet, <coughs> demanded that the New York Times not print the story. He made the argument to my editors that it would have compromised national security. The editors heeded these warnings and held my story. For several days, I argued with my editors and said this kind of method of finding people through these cell phones had been reported on, and besides, the terrorists are onto it. It's not going to hurt anybody. And that's what I had been hearing from sources of mine. It became clear to me that the CIA director was less concerned about security matters and more worried that the New York Times was going to give some credit for this very high-profile arrest to the Swiss government, who played a very important role in the case. Finally, the editors did the right thing and published my story, and I was relieved, of course. But I was also bothered by the frequency that this administration uses national security to attempt to stop investigative reporters from writing stories that will inform and enlighten readers. Government officials have grown bolder in trying to manipulate or control the news. They have anchors for hire, columnists for hire, White House correspondents for hire, and some editors and reporters have grown more timid in challenging these attempts at manipulating the news. Part of the reason for editors' reticence is that we're at war, but I believe another part of the reason for some editors' hesitancy is fear of failure. For some editors, lurking around the corner of every risky story is the chance that we'll get something wrong as reporters and be criticized instantly by bloggers and press critics. And God forbid, these editors think, perhaps we'll have to write an editor's note that will both be embarrassing and chip away some more at our credibility. Of course, when those kind of fears begin stopping investigative reporters from writing stories or compel editors to spike them, then they win. The people who abuse power win, whether they be in government or a crooked public corporation, but they win and the readers lose. People are hungering to find out whether the intelligence that led us to go to war was manipulated. The president says it wasn't. Some people in Congress say it was. If Congress refuses to investigate this very important public question, though, in a thorough manner, the only one left to do it is the American press. We've been doing this, but we have a lot more work to do. The recent scandals to hit my newspaper, which I'm sure many of you are aware of, beginning with Jason Blair and then the pre-war WMD coverage and most recently the Judy Miller case, have changed the atmosphere too and not for the better. Reporters and editors have to be smarter. They have to ask the right questions. We can't be stenographers. A lapse acknowledged by my editors in our WMD stories. Judy Miller said she got these stories wrong because her sources were wrong. Well, that may be, but there were plenty of sources around prior to the war who were quite skeptical about the intelligence. And some of those stories ran in our newspaper. People forget that. <coughs> Editors have to have more knowledge of the stories they edit, but even this can go too far. I must say that in some newsrooms, even in my own, I detect a creeping distrust by some editors of the reporters, some of the reporters who work for them. It's only natural, I guess, right? If reporters get editors in trouble for flawed stories, then editors will be more on guard against, publish against publishing flawed stories. But a reporter usually knows far more about a subject than an editor. And if editors won't trust some reporter's judgment, then why should the readers? An investigative reporter must rely on documents and anonymous sources to ferret out the truth. Documents are always better than sources, unless, of course, the documents prove to be fakes, as we saw in the CBS News coverage of President Bush's stint in the National Guard. There's no question that a decade ago, even five years ago, reporters had used anonymous sources too often. Often reporters, myself included, did not spell out why the source demanded confidentiality or what the source's agenda or motive was or might be to help readers make a judgment of the truthfulness of what the source was saying. Readers had every right to be skeptical of stories based on that kind of reporting. We've moved away from that now, but not entirely. And doing away with anonymous sources, which some people are advocating, is impossible especially when covering intelligence issues and national security and wrongdoing of all kinds. 
Now, the numbers are not all bad. I don't want to be all doom and gloom here. Circulation is down at nearly every newspaper, but more people are reading newspapers than ever before. They're just reading them online. And I believe that the bloggers who put up links to big stories at newspapers around the country and then comment on them actually serve as this enormous echo chamber for newspapers and actually increase our reach. In September, 21 million people visited nytimes.com. 21 million. That's on top of the several million people who read the newspaper every day. The newspaper executives just have to figure out a way to squeeze enough money out of those 21 million unique visits to be sure we have the resources to devote, all, devote to all the great things we do. And that includes the New York Times nine-person investigative team, which I'm on. A team, by the way, that's won a Pulitzer Prize in three of the last four years, not just for terrorism, but also for workplace safety and the dangers of railroad crossings. So the news is not all bad. Every day across America, reporters manage to root out wrongdoing, serve as a check on power and the powerful, and shine a light on the vulnerable and downtrodden. In small towns and large towns, these reporters and their editors and publishers are true American heroes. Yesterday in Texas, my friend Maureen Dowd said this, it doesn't matter how we tell the story, with hieroglyphics, with a royal typewriter, with an IBM ThinkPad, with a cell phone, with a Blackberry, just tell the story. And she's right. If readers perceive that we are no longer telling them the stories that they cannot learn by glancing at the homepage of Yahoo, then the career we have all chosen is truly endangered. As long as we continue to try to tell the hardest stories, follow the truth wherever it may lead, publish the facts without fear or favor, then we'll always have readers and newspapers will never die. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm not sure whether the dean mentioned that you were uh, the editor-in-chief of Brief for three semesters. Is that right? Three long semesters. Probably accounted for your 1.1 cube. Uh, uh, actually, you graduated with uh, the Scarlet T, which is the highest award uh, in the class. So uh, you managed to, to do both. And I'm, my source may be wrong on this, but aren't you? Uh, were you recently appointed assistant foreign editor as well? Yes. Good source. <laughs> I figured if I can't beat him, I'll join him. Yeah, I was going to say whether you, you still feel that uh, reporters know more than editors. <laughs> well, I do today. I haven't joined, I haven't joined the desk yet. Right. See, see, Arthur Sulzberger said the other day, he said that editors run the paper, not reporters. So I said, well, maybe I should become an editor. <laughs> Good idea. Okay. Uh, I'm going to give the floor to Tom Fiedler in one second, but there was one thing I caught on your resume that the dean didn't highlight, and I'd like to. Uh, you're a triathlete, and a great one, has won uh, any number of contests, a physical fitness club. He's also donated, now get this, gallons, gallons of blood to the Red Cross. He lives with his wife in the Miami area and their pet vampire, Slurpee. <laughs> um, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> I don't know how to respond on that. Uh, uh, I put that because I, I was feeling uh, some pressure that uh, that I ought to have some kind of community service on my resume, something that you know sounds altruistic. And uh, um, but uh, being in the profession that I'm in, being a journalist, there's really not much that you can do that won't at some point put you in a situation that you might either be uncomfortable or regret. Uh, I uh, I had an editor when I was uh, a beginning reporter who said that he wouldn't even belong to a a religious faith except that his wife forced him to when they were married. But other than that, the belief was you just try to remain as independent and distant from uh, from any part of the community that you might cover. But I figured giving blood would be something that would be safe, that, uh, that if I gave it, uh, you know, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't taking money and I wasn't uh, necessarily, it was, it was a pretty safe thing. So, so I found myself doing that and I just fell into the habit, habit of doing it over. And before I knew it, I was getting these things from the Red Cross that I had hit 12 gallons and 13 gallons and it sounded uh, 
pretty impressive. I feel like I give a lot more blood now that I'm the editor of the paper, though. It's a different kind. It, uh, it ends up on the, on the floor. Um, you know, I appreciate so much uh, the words that, that Don said. They're, uh, they're just more than gracious. He is a terrific credit, uh, not just to Boston University, which all of you know, but uh, to the Miami Herald. We are always proud in Miami when uh, there is a story, very often um, a story on the front page of the New York Times by Don Van Natta. They always mean something, but uh, we all then go around and kind of pat ourselves and say, geez, you know, we, we knew Don uh, when he was here. I once taught him something. And uh, we can, whether that's true or not, we take a lot of pride in. I appreciate your kind words. Um, and I'm glad he ended his comments on a bit of an up note there. Otherwise, I was just going to run across the street in front of one of the trolleys and figure it's, <laughs> let me just end this right here. Um, I, I would like to pick up a couple of points on the uh, overall theme, and I hope that we have time, and I hope that you are uh, armed with some questions. That may be the better way for me to hit points that you all are interested in. Um, but in the broad, uh, the theme that, that we're here to talk about, the importance of, of uh, investigative reporting or enterprise reporting, the kind of reporting that just would not happen well, were there not uh, uh, newspapers or, or television stations, uh, news media that, um, that, uh, that takes, took a gamble, made investments, uh, investments that often may not pay off, um, pursuing questions that come up for no other reason than these are questions that are um, perhaps we see as important to the uh, greater good of the community. Um, the the um, newspaper that uh, I am part of, the Miami Herald, is part of um, both the good and the bad of a large uh, chain, a corporation, the Knight Ritter Corporation, Knight Ritter Newspapers. Um, I think on balance it has a very good reputation for, uh, for putting journalism and quality journalism um, very high on its, uh, its priorities, recognizing that it's a creature of uh, the commercial world. But journalism has always mattered a lot. And one of the, the, uh, the, the uh, core values that the uh, company puts forth, uh, it's on the website, so I guess it means something, but it is something that uh, is talked about, is uh, that a core value of Knight Ritter newspapers is to publish newspapers that are worthy of First Amendment protection. I don't know how they came up with that, uh, with that line. I can only imagine that there were a number of discussions. I, I, I hope that it wasn't just some consultant who put it forward, because I, I think there's a lot of meaning in, uh, uh, in that, in uh, what goes into publishing a newspaper that, uh, that has the unique protection of the First Amendment. There is no other business in, uh, in, our, in our country that is specifically protected uh, in the Constitution of the United States, except the press. So right away, that tells you that it's special. And the other part of it that I think has meaning is when, when you say that to publish newspapers that are worthy of that. There are a lot of newspapers here or periodicals that are out there, and they, they have a purpose, and they accomplish uh, um, worthy goals. Perhaps they're, it's, it's, uh, it's about humor. Maybe it's uh, silly, uh, fishing, uh, all kinds of things. And that's, uh, those are all protected uh, by the First Amendment. But when we talk about doing something that's worthy of the First Amendment's protection, I think there we're in the area of doing something that, that um, tests the limit that really says that we're willing to uh, ask uncomfortable questions, to put them out there for the public to, uh, to respond to or not respond to. And, um, uh, and if people come after us, if, if there is a legal issue involved, we'll wrap ourselves in this unique protection and, um, uh, and, and claim um, that the status that I think the found, Founding Fathers uh, intended for it. So, uh, so I, I kind of want to start at that point because uh, it gets to the, the whole role of investigative uh, reporting, where it is, and the fact that it's under attack, as, uh, as Don said. Uh, there's no question 
that uh, the news media, the news, uh, the newspaper business, in many ways, the broadcast journalism, uh, the news divisions of broadcast journalism are under fierce attack. Uh, from the from the marketplace, um, and the marketplace, I suppose, ultimately, is uh, is affected by the individual decisions, the decisions made by each and every one of us. Uh, the question that uh, comes up for those of us who are doing journalism that we believe is worthy of First Amendment protection is: is this something that is compatible? with the marketplace and what the market demands. I mean, uh, j j frankly, uh, the uh, corporate uh, corporations have no conscience. Uh, that's why laws regulate them. I don't say that to disparage corporations. They're just not set up that way. They operate with a single goal, um, uh, and it's, uh, it's simply that, that greed is good. Greed is the goal. The more greedy you are, the more efficient uh, the corporation will be, and that's uh, uh, ultimately the way that they have to operate and function. For us, the problem arises when we are part of a corporation that has this as its survival imperative, greed, and yet our side of, um, of what we do in many cases has to operate completely divorced from that, that, it's, uh, that we aren't looking to make a profit, we aren't looking for efficiencies. We are in many ways the soul and the conscience. This isn't a new um, struggle. When I was uh, invited to come here and speak today, I was uh, doing some research, always a good thing, and uh, I, I uh, came across the, uh, an essay, I hope some of you see it or have seen it, that was uh, written by Joseph Pulitzer, uh, 1904, in which he argued on behalf of journalism education. This was a controversial position to take, apparently, in 1904. But um, in it, he talks about how, uh, uh, what would be the curriculum of a journalism program if there was one to, to be had at a school. And uh, he gets off onto the subject of whether part of this might be the, the business side of a newspaper. And I, if you'll indulge me, I want to read uh, his comment then. He said, commercialism has a legitimate place in a newspaper, namely in the business office. The more successful a newspaper is commercially, the better, it's, uh, better for its moral side. The more prosperous it is, the more independent it can afford to be. The higher salaries it can pay to editors and reporters, that's certainly a good thing. The less subject it will be to temptation, the better it can stand losses for the sake of principle and conviction. But commercialism, which is proper and necessary in the business office, becomes a degradation and a danger when it invades the editorial rooms. Once let the public come to regard the, the press as exclusively a commercial business, and there is the end of its moral power. Influence cannot exist without public confidence, and that confidence must have a human basis. It must rest in the end on the character of the journalist. The editor, the real journalist of the future, must be a man of such known integrity that he, I'm sure she, uh, will be above the suspicion of writing or editing against his or her convictions. He must be known as one who would resign rather than sacrifice his principles to any business interest. It would be well if the editor of every newspaper were also its proprietor, but every editor can at least be the proprietor of himself or herself. If he or she cannot keep the paper from degrading itself, he or she can refuse to be a party to the degradation. I, 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 was, um, I was impressed by that, I guess in part because it was, again, written 101 years ago, and yet the issue that uh, he apparently was willing to raise and argue for is an issue that has come fully home to roost with those of us who are in situations where the business of um, the newspaper looms very large. And, uh, and it's a reality that we have to struggle with. Uh, and it's the, the question is, the dilemma is, can we do the kind of journalism that, uh, again, pushes the edge, as Don pointed out, is expensive, is risky, can get the newspaper in trouble, and, um, and, and have that be compatible with the profit-seeking motive of the, uh, of the corporations that own us and ultimately the investors who own those corporations. Uh, 
I, I, I wish I knew the answer. I think we are working through that answer now. Um, and um, it may be your generation that ultimately decides it, I hope uh, positively. But there is uh, also, um, and, and Pulitzer touches on it, and it's argued, um, it's being argued, um, I think, more forcefully even now as that corporate grip tightens. There is an argument, in fact, that you can uh, measure uh, the profitability, the business uh, efficacy, the business reason for having investigative reporting and entrepreneurial reporting in a newspaper. And it comes if you, if you look at what we do not as being that we are in the newspaper business or a licensee of a uh, television or radio station, but if what you you look at what we do as uh, being ultimately influence peddlers, and um, there's actually a, a professor at the University of North Carolina, Philip Meyer, also a former Miami Herald uh, reporter. Philip Meyer uh, uh, has written a book called, unfortunately, The Vanishing Newspaper. But in it, he argues that that uh, what we are uh, we are fundamentally about is uh, is is influence. That what we do and that makes us valued to the public is uh, we we gather information that's people that people want. We collect it. Um, we apply our conscience to it, our ethics, our, our brains, and we put it out in such a way that people feel it has value to their lives. And if we do it well, it also can influence the course of events positively, hopefully, in a, in a community. And if we can do that and do it well and become known for it, people will come to us frequently. And if they come to us frequently, people who have goods to sell, advertisers, will also want to associate with us. And it becomes a virtuous cycle, that the more influence we have, the more people will want to see us, and the more people who want to see us, the more business will want to associate it with us, and we will become successful. I, I, and I believe that that's true. I think that model works. The um, question that, though, we are struggling with is how to make it work. Uh, can we make it work long enough in newspapers uh, until the transition to what comes next after newspapers uh, is successful? So that one day when you or your children are there and you want to know what is important for me to know in this community, however you get it, there will be a trusted place where you can go and you can get it. And people uh, have invested, have taken chances again, have um, uh, been worthy of that First Amendment protection and put that information out there. Um, I have to believe that there is always going to be a, uh, a, a hunger for that and a place for that. Um, I'm just not quite sure I can tell you how that's going to be in the future. So thank you. Thank you. I I'm going to. Uh use the chairman's prerogative to throw one question here that I'd like both of you to address. And it has to do with uh, the question of confidential sources and what we've been witnessing the past several months. Uh, I remember when the uh, Brandsburg case was decided in 1972, which was uh, reporters, uh, three different reporters uh, were uh, trying to get the Supreme Court to interpret the Constitution, the First Amendment, as barring uh, the compulsory testimony of reporters before grand juries or, or others uh, to disclose their confidential sources. And the court decided five to four against the reporters. And Justice uh, Byron White, who wrote the opinion, said, we've never had constitutional protection for reporters and yet we've had a vibrant and aggressive press throughout the history of the country. I remember feeling pretty good at that point that uh, may maybe we were being unduly alarmist and, and maybe uh, our record of uh, aggressive work over two centuries um, was the, the answer to claims of absolute constitutional privilege. I, I have an entirely different feeling uh, the last year or so as I've been watching the parade of reporters uh, go before grand juries in the, uh, call it the Plame case, call it the Wilson case, the Libby case, whatever case you want to call it. Uh, my, my sense is that 
uh, if not already, at least by the time this has run its course, it will be very damaging to the way reporters work, the sources they rely on. And I put myself back in time some years to when I was covering, for example, the Pentagon. And I, I think there are a lot of sources that I used at that time that uh, wouldn't be available to me now. Uh, and I'm wondering how you feel about that. Mm, I, I, I agree with that. I think it is uh, a, a, uh, a troubling development. The, the fundamental problem uh, that we face as journalists uh, in any situation where we are called to testify uh, either before a grand jury in any in any way is that we are then uh, uh, slipping out of the role that that we believe we need to uh, rightly occupy all the time in society and this is it's a tricky thing to to make that claim because you don't uh, you don't as a journalist want to put yourself above the citizenry. You, you, it's, uh, I think, a, a dangerous uh, thing to ask for special privilege of any kind. Uh, it, it's troubling when you, as a reporter, get special access uh, simply because you happen to work for a news organization. You can go places that other people can't. Um, but I suppose that for practical um, purposes, we accept those uh, those kinds of special privileges. But. Um, but I think as a fundamental principle, we should only ask for those things that a citizen would be entitled to get because we are, after all, we hold ourselves out to be the, um, the eyes and ears of the citizens and in that the classic sense, the watchdog of, of power and government power in particular. Um, so when uh, government comes to us and says to us that you have information that we want because it's important in a in a criminal case more often than not than not um, uh, we uh, if we agree to do that then we have in we have then signaled to other people that uh, that information that we have obtained in our role as being this this independent watchdog of government um, can be compromised, can be broached, that we are, that, uh, that we can be used. And, and I, uh, uh, we should never do that, or we shouldn't uh, with, without great, great uh, uh, efforts to, uh, to resist. So um, I don't know that I've answered the question there. I feel, I think there is a conflict between our role as citizens and our role as journalists. But I would always want to put the role as journalists first, because if we are ever seen as being just instruments of government, then we have lost our ability to be that watchdog. Uh, I, I believe the, the plain case has had uh, a horrible effect on working journalists. Every time a journalist goes before a grand jury and testifies about a conversation with a confidential source, even if that confidential source gives the journalist permission, it's a terrible thing. It, it, there's a chilling effect that occurs uh, that, that very day with the working reporters who are covering the Pentagon and the White House and the CIA and the FBI, because those sources think in the back of their mind, well, what if you're, you're promising me confidentiality? Your colleague just went and testified about some other confidential source. A lot of times the sources don't look at the details. They just, they read the headlines and they know that there's this erosion of the confidential source journalist relationship. So, uh, Bob, you said, you, you know, you know of some people that when you were at the Pentagon you expect today wouldn't talk to you, and I, I think that's right. I, um, a colleague of mine who covers the White House at the Times, David Sanger, said he's noticed that he's having a much harder time getting people who normally a year or two or three years ago were willing to talk with him, to talk with him now. And he attributes it not only to the Plain case, but to this constant uh, barrage of leak investigations. And we have another one just in the last week that Congress has launched on the, on the Dana Priest story that I mentioned. So it's, it's, uh, it's very difficult and it makes the job of the investigative reporter much, much harder. Already was hard and it's even harder now than it was uh, a couple years ago. It's a very bad atmosphere. Thank you. Let's take some questions from the audience. <coughs> Where does that put you with regard to a shooting? 
Where, where does that put you? Where does that analysis put you with respect to a shield law? There should be a shield law. I think there should be a federal shield law. There's a shield law in 49 states. The only state where there isn't one is Wyoming, and I believe uniformly there should be a shield law in the federal courts and in the state courts. Should That's an law, easy one. Should it offer absolute protection? What, what is your definition of My absolute definition protection? My definition is absolute is that under no circumstances can a reporter be required to testify uh, with respect to confidential sources or provide notes of conversations <coughs> initiated with the uh, even if, even if, if, if there's a situation similar to the Flame case where a prosecutor is investigating a, a, a situation where a journalist might be a witness to a crime? Well, certainly, uh, certainly that would be one. Uh, uh, or go back to the three cases involved in Brandsburg. You had a reporter that knew about uh, dope manufacturing process. You right. had two that may have been privy to uh, crimes that were planned by the Black Panther Party including one uh, reporter from the Times, Earl Caldwell, was part of that case. Um, yes, I think there should be an absolute, uh, I think it should be absolute. It probably wouldn't be uh, with this Congress, but I believe that that's what you ask for it and get the best you can get. Yeah, yeah I, I would obviously agree that uh, we should strive for the absolute. I, I do think, though, that those uh, shield laws that uh, um, uh, would in effect mean that only as the very last resort and that they have a very high bar that a prosecution would have to overcome in order to even call in a reporter. Uh, they've worked fairly well and typically that bar is that it gets down to the point that if the reporter, we're talking about a criminal case here, if the reporter is the only witness to a crime then uh, perhaps that you meet the bar. But, but uh, I, I don't know that there's ever been a case like that. So, uh, but I, I think it's absolutely important for us to do what we do. Say so yes, um, because you still, uh, as a, a blogger, you may protect this, uh, under a shield law, um, but uh, you still face all the other possible sanctions that anybody does who is publishing. You know, you can be you can libel, you can, those kinds of issues are, are still restraints there. Now, I believe that, um, that the shield laws that are pending in Congress, uh, one of them is at Biden's, includes um, uh, bloggers, specifically says means uh, that, that would include bloggers. The shield law in Florida um, it includes bloggers, but primarily because it's worded in such a way that it's people who publish in newspapers and in, in, in a, it just says essentially in virtually any other way we can imagine, and bloggers would fit in that. So. Yeah, I, I agree. It absolutely should include bloggers. If a blogger is a citizen journalist then and, and acting as a citizen journalist and interviewing sources and promising confidentiality, it should apply to a blogger just as it does a reporter for a, a major newspaper. Yes. Mr. Van Etten, you mentioned that you think competition is a good thing, and I was wondering if you could just talk about what you think are the positive aspects of competition. Given the increase in competition, there's also been a decline in the quality of journalism, particularly in broadcast news. It's celebrity-driven. There's not many serious issues. <coughs> Question, uh, let me repeat it just yeah, of course. Uh, is whether since you said competition is a good thing, why is it a good thing since in many cases it leads to uh, types of presentations that uh, may not qualify as, as good journalism? That's a paraphrase. It's a, it's a great question. I, I, I just come from the school that the more reporters there are trying to find a story, the more newspapers that exist in a city, uh, the more news outlets there are in a given place, the better quality the journalism will be. That's what I was referring to. I think what you're referring to is there's this explosion with bloggers and with various cable news and everything else. And I see that less as competition and more as various niche, niches being filled by all of this, this great variety. There's hundreds and hundreds of bloggers writing about all sorts of different subjects. And that's not necessarily competition. It's competition if there's some investigative citizen journalists who do what I do 
and are trying to get the same story I'm getting. That's what, that was the context of what I meant where competition is a really good thing. But most cities in America now are one newspaper towns. And, you know, living in London, it's a, it's a 10 newspaper town. And it was incredible to see. There was a lot of bad, you know, the sun and there's certain newspapers that are garbage. But, but, they're, but the, real, the real broadsheet newspapers uh, do a, a really terrific job in London. And, and, and you see it. So the more competition there is, the better quality product will always be. I hope I've answered your question. I don't know if I have. Did I not? I just think also ratings, I mean, it's a cable news in particular, and I just think that with the in increase in competition, there's been a declining quality of cable news, in my opinion. Again, she mentions Celebrity increased trend. competition, declining quality, particularly in cable news. Yeah. I, again, I, I go back to, I think there are, that, that's definitely true. Uh, and. Um, Maybe the cable news is the exception that proves the rule. I was talking more about, about the journalism that, that the network news shows do and that the big newspapers do. Um, you know, when, when I'm competing on a story about the intelligence, the Iraq intelligence, I'm competing against the Washington Post, the LA Times, the Wall Street Journal, NBC, ABC. The, the more people that are fighting for that information, the better the final product's going to be. You're, you're asking a, a very good question, though. There's more of these shows, and, and it seems the more shows there are, the worse the, the, the quality gets. I think, it's a, I think it's more entertainment and less journalism, kind of what you're asking about. The reason I was late was because I did an interview with cable news, and I think they're wonderful people. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll see tonight when you see what they do about, about the interview. <laughs> Right. Well, they, because the fundamental uh, protection that you are seeking is the protection not to respond uh, to a, a legitimate subpoena, for instance, to testify before a grand jury. Um, as a citizen, that would be uh, incumbent upon you to respond positively to. As a journalist, you have a different conflict. Uh, you, you may be the possessor of information that came to you in confidence that had something to do that was critical of Let's make in the in the crudest case. Let's say the uh, the prosecuting attorney in your community is um, corrupt, and you have information that 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 uh, that has come to you from a, from a source that maybe bribed that, and you've written stories, and that's those stories exposed corruption. Well, then you get a, a subpoena from the grand jury that this prosecutor is running. That's I'm making this very very simplistic, but I mean obviously if you were a citizen in possession of information, then summoned to a grand jury, you're obligated to respond. Um, and if not, you can be uh, uh, held in contempt of the grand jury. As a journalist, you have a higher obligation because you believe there was a greater public good in doing what you did, even though the information you took you received in confidence. So, um, so you are seeking a special privilege to not do what a citizen would have to do. And I'm saying, I think in that case, that is, to me, uh, one of the exceptions that I believe a journalist needs to have. Otherwise, a journalist should be very, very reluctant to seek any privilege that sets him or her apart from a citizen. So, and just to follow up, just to one more question. Um, and so you talk about um, bloggers also being able to be defended under the shield law. So where do you draw the line between what a citizen and a journalist? The question well, is, where it, do you draw the line between a citizen and a journalist if your position is that bloggers yeah. are protected under the shield law? Yeah, that's a, it's a very interesting question because that whole area is evolving, and I uh, don't know that it's settled yet. But <clears throat> assuming that the blogger has some kind of a public uh, outlet and a following, um, how do you deny the blogger the same First Amendment protection that we in the press would claim for ourselves? I mean, how do you define what the press is, and if a if a blogger has the ability to um, to publish in some way, and in this particular case, it would be because of that ability to publish. Because of what's important here, I didn't mention this. It's because of the 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 business that you're in, that you would come into information that you would deem. Um, important that you withhold. That's that's a, one of the tests that would have to apply. And it would apply, I think, equally to because a blogger had a blog and because that blog had a following, 
that blogger came into information that, um, that again, they kept in confidence and published, they should enjoy the same protection that I believe the, uh, a, what we'd see as the mainstream media would enjoy, because the function is the same. The gentleman in the back there. A little, a little louder, please. Do you think the current investigation to the uh, CIA leak is detrimental, even though it's viewed as the White House using the press for its own purposes? Uh, the question is, <coughs> do, do either of you think the investigation of the White House leak in the uh, famous uh, Flame Wilson case is detrimental, even though it's uh, an investigation into the White House retaliating against uh, someone whose views it didn't like. Well, what you, what you want to take the first one? Oh, well, you're, you're an expert in this. Uh, <laughs> it's a, it, I, I, think, I think what I am understanding your question is, is de detrimental, you mean the investigation detrimental to journalists, yeah. even though the actual subject <laughs> is, is potentially the White House smearing a covert operative. Uh, well, as, as Pat Fitzgerald explained when he had that press conference when he announced the indictment of Scooter Libby, uh, he, di he didn't want to, originally he was investigating a leak. And it turned out uh, one of the people that he was investigating, Scooter Libby, the chief of staff to Vice President Cheney, uh, made some statements that he found were um, uh, misleading or possibly not truthful. And the only way to get at that was to actually interview the journalists themselves. He said he didn't want to do that, but he, he really had no <laughs> choice to do it. So um, when I say it's detrimental, what I mean to say is any time a journalist um, testifies, regardless of what the subject matter is, it's detrimental. That's what I mean to say. I think, I think your question is, well, does it, because the subject matter here is a, is a, is a possible White House smear campaign, campaign uh, against somebody, does that change it? I, I really don't think so. Personally, I don't think so. I think it really has had, uh, as I said, a detrimental impact, according to the, my own colleagues and also according to some of the own work I've done, um, people are are uh, are spooked and scared uh, to to enter into these confidential agreements because everywhere around them, in, in Washington now there's this uh, there's this sort of uh, hue and cry for uh, for leak investigations. So I really don't think it it, it matters much. Well, you agree? I agree completely. <laughs> okay. In the back again. question yeah. for Mr. Fiedler was, uh, was covering the uh, Nixon administration in the early 1970s uh, more difficult than covering the current White House with all its uh, claimed secrecy? I, I covered, um, I'm not that old. <laughs> I actually covered the 1972 George Wallace campaign for the Democratic nomination uh, for president in 72. I didn't cover the Nixon administration. Uh, Nixon was the incumbent president, and uh, uh, and he didn't have a serious challenge on his side. I ended up uh, covering George Wallace because there was a very uh, crowded Democratic field trying to get the nomination to run against Nixon. Ultimately, George McGovern got the nomination and lost every state except for well, lost Massachusetts. It, Massachusetts. And, and the District of Columbia. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> Say, so, gee, how could that happen? <laughs> but uh, so I really can't answer your question on a firsthand. May I have a show experience. of hands as to how many know who George Wallace was? <laughs> okay. Next question. I'm beginning to get kids in my classes who don't remember who Ronald Reagan was. <laughs> Go ahead, Ann. I just want to pick up on that last question. If the intention of the White House was to um, deliberately use a shield law, let's say there was a shield law, to leak disinformation, that disinformation would never be found out because they couldn't propel the journalists to testify. And if that were the yeah. intention of the White House, it plays right into their hands. Uh, the, the question expresses concern that a shield law would give an administration the opportunity to use it in a way that's detrimental to the public interest. Is that right? Is that a fair? Uh, so if you pass a shield law, what would you do to curb the possible abuse of it? Mm -hmm. 
Well, your point is is a very good one, and um, so it puts uh, it, it creates the dilemma of uh, do you in effect allow that little chipping away at uh, at the law to go on so that we aren't put in a position of having to testify against someone who we know broke the law, and so it becomes um, uh, a, I guess a value equation. What which do we value more? Our um, what we believe is the damage. Uh, that can come from being drawn into the process where we become a part of it or that somebody would attempt to use the press, uh, I, I think I would still go for the latter. And would, would this mean that this case would have gone nowhere? I think the answer is yes. Would I have preferred it go nowhere? I think the answer is yes. Actually, what I would have preferred is if Judith Miller, having been leaked that information, would have turned around and written a story and said how insidious this White House is that it's attempting to discredit uh, a critic by exposing the identity of a CIA agent. That's what I wish she had done. Dr. Truman. <clears throat> in uh, <coughs> medical public, uh, publishing now, there are tremendous threats to the economic aspects, the business aspects, because of being able to get uh, uh, papers published in PubMed, <coughs> which is now free, uh, available mm. on the web, with uh, getting things online as you do with your newspapers. Uh, the way the New England Journal, which I'm uh, chairing the publication committee currently, handles this is by value added so that people continue to subscribe. They're doing new things and other things. Uh, one of the value added uh, activities you have is investigative reporting. Mm -hmm. And as you lose that, isn't that going to affect your economic survival as well? Because people are going to be able to get the information uh, if you're just reporting what happened. Right. Uh, you know, why would I want to uh, subscribe to the Miami Herald, say? <laughs> and you take that. that that's a, it's a very good point. Um, obviously, we would consider the um, investigative reports that we do, the, what we also refer to as the enterprise reporting, the kind of reporting that wouldn't otherwise be done had we not done it, um, that, that in, that is, uh, uh, that's what dis distinguishes our business in many ways from other, maybe other newspapers or other um, media. So it's important. The problem, though, I suppose, is to get the, to find a way uh, to get the marketplace to value it separately. Now, I, and I don't have an answer. It's not as if I could, on a day that the, uh, the investigative team for the Miami Herald has a page one story, I can charge more for the newspaper that day or say that you've, uh, before I will deliver it, you've got to pay extra. Um, we are finding other ways. It's not with investigative reporting. The New York Times is doing a lot of this. They're, they're taking uh, their signature columnists and um, uh, they're, they're putting them th online only if you pay extra. Can you read Maureen Dowd online or Tom Friedman online and so forth? So, and finding a few features, I think, like that. And uh, so we're looking to f find ways to s kind of screen off what we believe is our unique content, that value-added content that you describe, and ask people to pay extra for it. And then the rest, in effect, will say, this is, um, this is in the public domain. We'll, we'll do it. Yes, it costs us money, but, but that you expect that of us. Uh, we're, we're dabbling in that area. Um, I wish we could find a way, though, where investigative reporting and enterprise reporting um, that we could f we could attach a special value to that. It's hard to do it, but I do believe that overall, a newspaper that does investigative reporting, and even though it's 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 not every day, uh, it enhances the value of the brand. I sound like I'm from uh, Madison Avenue now, but uh, but it, it means more. Um, I believe it means more when I say to people, I don't want to give offense from, to any people maybe from a competing paper in South Florida, but when I say I'm with the Miami Herald, that brand means more than if I say I'm with the Naples Daily News or the South Florida Sun Sentinel, good papers, but what distinguishes us is we do that extra thing. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not easily measured, but it's there someplace. I just want to take one, one quick crack at that. Uh, Tom is right. The Times Select uh, experiment, really, for lack of a better word, that the Times is now undergoing, where the marquee op-ed columnists 
are only available to home subscribers, and if you're not a home subscriber, you have to pay $50 a year, um, is, is an attempt at doing this, a sort of unlocking value of a special part of the paper. Um, I, this is for the business folks to figure out. They've got to figure out um, when the New York Times does a, a story of prize-winning caliber, how to unlock the value. You can't quantify it, as, as, as Tom says, but maybe there's a way with advertising. I know that when there's a really big story that the Times breaks, there are millions of more people who go to that particular page and look at it versus just a story about what George Bush said yesterday. And maybe there's a way with that, with more traffic on that particular page where they can get a higher premium from the advertisers. But that's, they've got to figure that out. I mean, everything's riding on that question. Dean Schultz. Yeah, I'd like to follow up right here. Uh, while it's honored, sadly, too often in the breach rather than the practice these days, statistics, first of all, show that journalists today probably get their initial tip up to 80% of the time from public relations, that is to say, the spokesman at the White House, the State Department, wherever. But then separately and immediately, if they're any good at all, and here's where too many honored in the breach, investigation goes on. Double trip, uh, check, triple check, new, find other sources, shoe leather, phone calls, so that by the end of the day, there's value added that that reporter has that vastly exceeds what the public relations person might have delivered as the first prima facie story. The question is, given that all we're talking about here is distance in time from several weeks of work versus a day of work, what else distinguishes investigative reporting and those teams you create from the daily slog of the best reporters on your papers? Well, uh, I'll just, if I'm understanding right, I'll give w one example. I think what distinguishes investigative reporting from the, uh, from the daily report, which uh, I think is very important and there is a lot of value added in it when you have a good journalist who does it. But um, uh, time is an expensive commodity, the time you invest in studying something and becoming expert in it. And uh, what the investigative reporters are able to do with that time is they are able to ask and pursue questions that um, the, the daily reporter simply doesn't have the time to do. And uh, one easy example um, for us is uh, we had uh, a series of stories last month or so, I think it was, um, on the reliability of hurricane forecasts. Now this would seem, I think all of us, those of us who live in hurricane prone areas, have uh, more or less accepted as, uh, as gospel that the hurricane forecasts uh, people are, they're all hard working and they're knowledgeable and they're up, they have up to the, to the minute equipment and you know, they, they've got the latest stuff to, uh, to do what they do to protect us. Um, and the, the daily reporters who are covering the hurricanes have their hands full writing about, you know, whether this hurricane is going to jog left or right, whatever it's going to do. But what we did is we had investigative reporters take a look and say, well, well you know what, the, um, the, we, we, we do appreciate it when they tell us that the track is going to do this, but how do we know when it went wrong, why did it go wrong? Is it just Mother Nature, you know, had a joke for us, or was it, well, we found out by letting a reporter go for six months into every aspect of uh, how the Hurricane Center actually uh, tracks a hurricane, that they are operating in a Rube Goldberg system with technology that is so old and outdated. And if we hadn't have done that, we would never know the answers to the questions about how they can be 300 miles off in a 24-hour forecast. And uh, it's not because Mother Nature played a trick. It's because the instruments that were supposed to catch the move didn't work that day. Or that, uh, that uh, and this is true, that NOAA didn't let the Hurricane Center fly the plane into the storm because it was on a budget cut. These are all real things, and we wouldn't have found them out if we didn't have the ability to say to a reporter, take all the time you need, ask all the questions you want. Why is it that we miss on some hurricanes? And so, just simple. You know. I'm not <clears throat> Now you've done it. In addition to looking up George Wallace, they have to look up Rube Goldberg. <laughs> <laughs> yes, back there.
question is, uh, can you elaborate on your observation when you were in Britain that the British press was tougher on Tony Blair, the Prime Minister, than what you've seen here? And is there any su suggestion you might have for uh, making the uh, American press more fierce? Uh, the, it's a great question. The um, run-up to the war uh, prior to the invasion of Iraq in March of 2003, this is even before I got there in the fall of 2002, the British press was asking very tough questions in real time about the British uh, assessment that a missile fired from Baghdad would hit London in 45 minutes. It turned out to be not true. And they were challenging it and, and asking Tony Blair questions about it prior to the invasion. These were not questions that were being asked of George W. Bush at the same time. So, uh, and then after the war, they aggressively went after, I'm sure some of you here have heard about the Downing Street memo. Uh, there hasn't been a lot written in the American press about the Downing Street memo. And for those of you who don't know about it, it's, it's minutes of a meeting that were taken in the summer of 2002 uh, at 10 Downing Street, uh, a meeting that Tony Blair was at. It was written by a guy named Matt Rycroft, who was Tony Blair's foreign policy aid, and basically the minutes show that the Americans, and George W. Bush in particular, had already decided at that time that we were going to go to war with Iraq. And the, the bloggers picked up on this, and we've written about it, not a lot, uh, but this was a big story in Britain, and written about and, and covered far more aggressively than we covered it. What we can learn from, uh, from, uh, from the way they do things is just uh, hold public officials' feet to the fire more than we do. Um, this is a relatively new phenomenon, and I believe a lot of it has to do with 9-11. Uh, everybody was so shocked by that event in this country and around the world. We had so much goodwill around the world. We wanted to give this president a chance, and I think people in the press as well did that. And that deferential thing I was talking about on the podium is, is I think, was began then. And uh, with each passing month uh, after the war, uh, you've seen a little bit less of that. But it's still there. Um, the Brits weren't attacked on 9-11, so they didn't have that um, as a starting point. And so they have a tradition there of really holding politicians' feet to the fire. I mean, think back during the Clinton administration, the tough questions asked of Bill Clinton about uh, his relationship with a former White House intern. I mean, they, he was uh, aggressively asked questions about that. And uh, our current president, I don't believe, until only until recently, has not been asked aggressive questions about the handling of the war, about the intelligence, and about a lot of other things. I mean, Hurricane Katrina was sort of the tipping point in a way um, where the questions have gotten much tougher of this president. Thank you. I guess my question is, are reporters not asking the tough questions because there's some internal climate of fear of reprisal from the government in the newsrooms today? Or, you know, what's, what's, what's the, uh, the root of that? I guess you could, you could call it a problem because it, there doesn't seem to be many, uh, you know, the expository reports that we, that we see in newspapers and on, on television. Um, question goes to the motivation of reporters who are not tenacious enough in questioning the White House. Is it because they fear reprisal? I don't think so. No, I don't think it's a fear of reprisal. Uh, as I was saying earlier, I think part of it was uh, the press wanted to give this president a chance after 9-11 and, um, um, and, and did do that. Uh, the, um, uh, th there's, there's no question it's a problem. Um, and, and as I said, I think only recently in the last few months we're starting to see that we're, we're turning the corner a little bit with, with some of the questions um, that have been asked of the president. So I, I don't think this is a permanent condition. I really do believe it's unique to 9-11. To and, and remember all the terror alerts. I, I can't emphasize enough to you guys 
the terror alerts and, and the way it, it looked to me from London. If you remember in 2004, we were hearing about uh, threats to the United States on almost a monthly basis. If you remember in August of 2004, Tom Ridge, then the Homeland Security Director, on a Sunday had a press conference and talked about how five buildings in New York and Washington and Newark were possibly, possibly going to be attacked. Have we heard about any terror uh, alerts or things since November of 2004? Occasionally, one or two, maybe New York, the subway, I think, a few months ago. But it's not the same thing. And I was hearing from my sources in Europe, because I was talking to a lot of intelligence officials in Europe who deal with this, that they didn't know why the United States was so sort of spun up with worry. They said, we're looking at the same intelligence. We're not seeing this. I wrote a story about it. It ran in October of 2004. You can look it up in the New York Times. They were suggesting that it, politics were behind it. And, and that was their view. And I, and I reported as such. They might be wrong. And of course, the CIA and the White House disagree with that. Um, you know, I, I use that as an example of I, I didn't have any fear of reprisals in trying to go after that story. I, I, I went after it, and, and my newspaper published it. Um, I don't think it's that. I think it's, I think it's really just the environment that, that we went through. I think 9-11, the Iraq War, the invasion, and these terror alerts um, made journalists maybe not be as aggressive as they should have been in asking the tougher questions earlier on. But, but that's thankfully, we've definitely turned the corner. And to the last question, I'm going to go to one of the world's leading authorities on tough questions, Bill Lord, who was the first uh, executive producer of Nightline and taught Ted Koppel how to ask tough questions. Uh, you both uh, look toward uh, technology as uh, perhaps an answer to circulation problems and changing the approach of, on business of newspapers. Uh, so I'll, I'll use that uh, noun that's become a verb, Google. Uh, is Google uh, part of the solution or part of the problem? As you look down the road. Yes. <laughs> you, uh, you, got, you, got you know, question. what's that? Repeat the question. Well, the question is about uh, how we have both mentioned the uh, changing role of technology and how that can be uh, part of the solution to the problem, uh, to the challenge that we face. Um, and so the question is, would, would Google, is Google part of the problem or part of the solution? And I think the answer is it's, uh, uh, it, right now, there's so many good things about the Internet. In fact, I was talking uh, earlier today with Victoria about, about how the Internet has changed the way we go about reporting, what the uh, amount of information literally at our fingertips in a short amount of time is revolutionary compared to what it was 25 years or so ago. Um, that's self-evident. So that's a good thing. But what, um, what Google does, what Yahoo does, what other content uh, uh, aggregators do. They take all the work that we have mined, that, that, um, that we have created, um, and uh, they have their the search uh, engines out, and they go out and they grab it. And nothing bugs me more than to hear from somebody the comment about, oh, I read uh, such and such a story about that happened in Miami on Google. Well, actually, they read it. It was in the Miami Herald, and it was on our website. But Google grabbed it, and there it was in Google. And so to this person, and many like it, Google and Yahoo are the sources of news. They're the originators of news. And yet we don't get a nickel from them for what they do. So in that case, it's part of the problem. Uh, so, uh, but you know, in that uh, that old jujitsu move, if you do it right, we'll get the problem to become the solution. And I'm, and our hope would be that um, as we go forward, content aggregators like Yahoo and um, and and Google will also get to the point where they want to be in the business of supporting content generation and creation. And that means we become valuable to them, and that uh, they recognize that for them to move to the next level where they need to get, they, um, they, they need to not just aggregate, but they need to have places that create. That's what we do. We are content creators. And so my hope would be someday maybe Google will buy Knight Ritter, and then Knight Ritter will become valuable in a whole different way. Who knows? That's, uh, but, but I think it can be part of the solution. Thank you. Uh, let me make one announcement before oh, we thank our guests for their uh, 
comments and interpretive remarks. Uh, the two Pulitzer panels tomorrow morning are at the Hillel House, fourth floor. That's at 213 Bay State Road. The first panel is at 9.30 a.m. and the second is at 11 a.m. So we hope to see as many of you as possible there. And please join me in thanking Tom Fiedler and Don Van Atta. We'll be seeing more of them throughout the weekend. Very edifying comments. Thank you.